So here we go. Let's jump for today. We've got Jim Lee here. Hopefully you can see him on camera. And this is going to be talking about cloud seeding and, and what in the world is going on with our environment. And he's the president of Climate Viewer News. We also testified in the 2015 jet air pollution uh, discussion there at the EPA, everyone's favorite place to hang out. Weather modification, a lot of people are unaware that's been, been happening other than maybe thinking about trying to make it rain by seeding some clouds back in the day. And then also about the test ban treaties and a variety of other things going on all over the world and mm, how the UN gets involved in all of this nonsense. And then also as an author. So I'm gonna let him kind of do a little explanation of some of these areas. So my main website is Climate Viewer News at climateviewer.com. And I generally cover pollution, privacy, and propaganda. So the generally the three are related. So if you talk about pollution, somebody's gonna violate your privacy and they're definitely gonna make propaganda about you. And climate change is a great example of all three simultaneously occurring. And what most people don't know about climate change is that there are men and women who have had the ability to change the climate for the past 100 years. years. And that is one of my major focuses. Um, if you're on climateviewer.com and you click on geoengineering on the top menu, it's gonna take you to a website page called geoengineering and weather modification exposed. Now, this page has been around um, since 2013. And uh, this has been cited by the United Nations Environmental Program taught at Harvard University and cited all kinds of places. Um, but in a nutshell, the problem with geoengineering is that it will kill people. Now, what is geoengineering? It's the idea that global warming is so bad that we will technologically fix the environment by dumping chemicals in the sky to cool the planet rapidly. Um, and this is a monumentally bad idea. Uh, Professor David Keith in the video here admits that it will at the minimum kill many tens of thousands of people. And the truth of the matter is they have no idea how many. So the reason why I'm so um, fervent on this topic is because while everybody talks about climate change, nobody talks about the climate changers. And that's why I also created another website specifically for this topic. And it is weathermodificationhistory.com. On weathermodificationhistory.com, you can come through here and learn the entire history of weather modification through its many stages. Um, the early stages from 1800 to 1946 was known as pluviculture or just plain rain making. Um, and during this period, they tried everything from electrified sand to x-rays to cannons and mortars, just bursting things in the air, um, burning chemicals and bats. Um, one of the main, most famous stories from this time is um, Charles Mallory Hatfield, who in the 1910s uh, made it rain in Los Angeles. San Diego heard about it. They offered him $3 million um, to, to make it rain. And boy, did he. He made it rain so much that the dam broke and caused several, you know, actually they offered him 10000 He did $3 million worth of damage. And basically the city of San Diego refused to pay him because had they paid him, they would be admitting liability for all of that damage. And this is something that is repeated itself throughout the history of weather modification is that they want to experiment. They want the water resources, but they don't want any of the responsibility. In 1946, in the General Electric Laboratories, Vincent Schaefer, Irving Langmire, and Bernard Vonnegut invented cloud seeding. And that is the main uh, tool of choice worldwide that has been used ever since 1946. Less than a year later, in um, November of 1947, or October of 1947, they did Project Cirrus, where they um, were it was General Electric's um, labs, the, the scientists, and the U.S. Army uh, Weather Corps, they didn't have Air Force at the time, and um, 
they went out and seeded a tropical storm uh, and that tropical storm turned into a hurricane, changed directions and slammed into Georgia, killing three, mil three people and doing $3.2 million in damage. So repeated history, people screwing with the weather, bad things happening, no accountability. We're now at the point where we're you know, facing this geoengineering. And geoengineering is one of the greatest boogeymen around because it is taking cloud seeding and putting it on a worldwide scale. Um, in 2003, the National Academy of Sciences said that our, um, that basically our belief about cloud seeding is the same as it was um, 60 years ago, you know, that we, we still believe that cloud seeding has no efficacy whatsoever. So this, this science, there's the real, the science behind cloud seeding has not been proven to this day yet. They want to go ahead and do cloud seeding on a global scale. So that's a big deal. Um, and it's a very dangerous idea. And an even worse idea is the idea of space weather modification. And this is the same idea as cloud seeding, but done in space. And instead of using chemicals to make it rain, you know, water, they use electrons to make it precipitate out radiation or create artificial aurora. Um, and this is done with facilities like the heart facility, the ionospheric heaters. Um, they use sounding rockets, which spray barium, strontium, cesium, lithium, uh, many different chemicals, and they heat these with ground-based microwaves. All of this is going on simultaneously and nobody is the wiser. Part of the purpose of weathermodificationhistory.com is to educate you on the history. So of course we have 875 newspapers from 1800 to present that illustrate that history. And you can come through here and you know basically see, like I said, um, producing rain with x-rays, July 20th, 1919, and read the entire newspaper article. And you know it goes on and on and on. So as you start to learn about this history, what you also will notice is that, you know, in the early days, everything was covered. I mean, it was very widely discussed. I mean, you didn't have a Seagram 7, you know, Seagram's VO uh, alcohol commercial from 1947, man-made snow from, you know, planes. And since you know, since then, you know, the, the early days up to the 1970s, it's kind of tapered off and the coverage of weather modification, these types of activities in the me mainstream media have almost completely disappeared. You're not going to read much about this, you know, Army Signal Corps to work on program on weather control. Well, that's the problem because at, at what ends up happening is and I have a timeline on here. You can go through this and you can get tags and you can hit weather warfare that during, uh, during operation Popeye in, uh, March of 20th, 1967 through Mar July 5th, 1972, we did weather warfare. We being the CIA, the U.S. Air Force and the U.S. Navy over Vietnam. And this weather warfare uh, was to make mud not war. And you can actually see right here, these are silver iodide um, cloud seeding rack on the side of a C-130, um, a WC-130. It's actually supposed to, they were supposed to be just doing weather flights to see what the weather was going to be. But meanwhile, they were spraying silver iodide and lead iodide um add that to your agent orange as problems raining down from the sky in vietnam and this is the cold cloud modification system which is actually a cloud seeding bomb created by um the u.s navy at china lake california to this day the naval warfare center um in china lake california still practices weather modification and designs similar apparatus to this so the military not likely to ever stop doing this. Jack Anderson, um, brave reporter, or initially reported this in the Pentagon Papers. Senator Claiborne Pell was like, oh, really? And they had hearings. It became a worldwide event. 
where there were, you know, it was covered in so many different documents, weather as a weapon of war, cloud seeding over Vietnam, U.S. turns, let's just go to this one, CIA rain making over Laos has only indifferent re results. Um, rain making over trail tried by CIA. So Henry Kissinger and the military uh, basically didn't even tell the Secretary of Defense, uh, Melvin Laird, that they were gonna do this. And that's a big problem. So um, let's go back right here real quick. What happened was uh, very shortly after that, they banned weather warfare on a, on a worldwide scale. And it's called the Environmental Modification Convention Weather Warfare Ban also known as the Convention on the Prohibition of Military or Other Hostile Use of Environmental Modification Techniques. Um, and this was signed in 1978. So January 17th, um, 1980, it was fully ratified. And this basically bans, uh, the, the wording on it's kind of funny because everybody's like, well, then all weather warfare, um, all weather modification should have been banned. No. Weather modification was a ban, only military or other hostile techniques. So it says, um, each st state party to this convention undertakes not to engage in military or any other hostile use of environmental modification techniques having widespread, long lasting or severe effects as a means of destruction or damage or injury to any other state party. So, that's that's where we're at you know since 1978 when they banned weather warfare um it kind of gets real quiet after that now there were a couple other tiny things that happened um you know they they passed a law requiring reporting of weather modification it was called um the weather modification reporting act of 1972 um they also um had the National Weather Modification Policy Act of 1976 leading up to NMOD, and that required a report called Weather Modification Programs, Problems, Policy, and Potential, which was published in May of 1978. It's 778 pages telling every single dollar spent by the federal government and every program going on in America that was involved in weather modification. History has now repeated itself. We're in a situation where um, you know, nobody, nobody's aware that weather modification is even a thing. And, you know, this is the kind of report we need today. We need to know a full disclosure of what's going on, especially with the climate hysteria of the climate extremists who literally blame every storm, every hurricane's worse because of CO2. Everything is caused by global warming. Um, and they don't realize that militaries from around the world, private institutions, private companies, billions and trillions of dollars are being thrown around and thrown at changing the weather. And if you change the weather over a long enough term, then you change the climate. So that's why I say before you blame climate change, blame the climate changers. And that's why I've been pushing for a solution to that. And we'll get to that in just one second. To take it a step further, I wanted you know people to be able to visualize um, how big this problem is. So my third website is climateviewer.org. And that is where you can see Climate Viewer Maps. And on Climate Viewer Maps, I have a section on geoengineering and weather modification, wouldn't you know? And you can go through and you can individually see all of these maps. It links to all of my pages that are relevant to um, this topic, like climateviewer.com slash harp or climateviewer.com slash geoengineering. Um, the chemtrail phenomena, which most people are very um, affluent in or interested in, um, is climateviewer.com slash cirrus clouds matter. Yes, that is a play on the uh, blue lives matter, black lives matter, well, cirrus clouds matter, and there's a reason why. But regardless, uh, 50 years of the United Nations tracking weather modification projects, you can click on that, it'll take you to a 3D globe, and, you know, basically show you the map, um, 
on a 3d globe you can click on any one of these projects read all about it where it happened what what you know what had transpired and you can see the original sources for all of this the united station united nations world meteorological organization expert team on weather modification this is the wmo register of national weather modification projects from 1989 through 2006 and we only mapped out from the 89 to 99 and you still end up with a map that is quite covered as you can see here um if you laid it out flat this is what you get and let's pop into place that's a pretty covered map and so weather modification generally doesn't happen in poorer countries <laughs> or where it's very wet already it's mostly in the northern hemisphere and uh, as a result, we're the ones who are gonna see most of the effects. On Climate Viewer 3D, which is linked at the top of every page on, um, on there, you can see a combined map of all of the different weather modification programs, in addition to things like the ionospheric heaters um, from around the globe, like the Arecibo Observatory Enhanced High Frequency Ionospheric Heating Instrument, um, and the thing I find fascinating about Climate Viewer 3D is you can see ground-based cloud seeding generators indicated by the fire icons. Um, these are used for snowpack augmentation or making artificial snow on mountaintops. They are not planes, they are actually on the ground and they are constantly pumping chemicals into the sky. According to the government reports on this, you will notice that they run, this one says no, November through December. Um, this is, says January through September. So that one's like all year long, that's rare. Um, but generally speaking, um, ground-based cloud seeding generators run from October through March. So they're on right now. And what they will do is all winter long, try to put as much snow as possible on top of the mountains on the West Coast so that in the springtime they melt, provide water for the water strapped west coast and uh, produce power through hydroelectric dams. So this is, this is the current you know, weather modification scenario. As you can see many different projects in Texas, all along the Rocky Mountains, hundreds of projects in you know, California, and uh, Lake Tahoe or area, all, you know, all through the West. And what ends up happening, all of this air is gonna move over here to the East Coast and we end up with torrential floods, we end up with softball size hail, and of course they'll claim this has nothing to do with what we're doing on the West Coast, which is, you know, any, you know, eighth grader, you can ask them and they'll go, no, that's gotta be affecting something. And when I speak with the top scientists on the planet on this subject, they agree that something is happening, but there's no accountability whatsoever. So that's why I've proposed a, an add-on, if you will, to the weather warfare ban of 1978. Now it's called NMOD or the Environmental Modification Con Convention. The problem with NMOD was that it banned weather warfare, but it never really created a way to catch somebody in the act. And that's why at weathermodificationhistory.com, um, I referenced something that, you know, most people don't even know about, uh, the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. And the reason why this is important is because yeah, we had two, this is also from Climate Viewer Maps, you can see this, it's 2,615 nuclear bombs explode from around the globe. And then finally, they, they started to try to blow up the sky. They started to try to blow up the ionosphere um, with projects like Starfish Prime, Hardtack, and Fishbowl. Um, at this point, you know, the, the governments of the world said, look, you know, maybe we're taking this a bit too far and they agreed to ban upper atmospheric nuclear explosions altogether, meaning not in the ground, not in the air, not in space, the only, not underwater. The only place you're allowed to actually test a nuclear bomb today is underground in the dirt. It has to be in a buried facility. So what they do, they were smart enough to create something called the International Monitoring System. It's run by the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization. 
it's one of the the people who have cited my website they actually cited my nuclear um explosion map um now the the international monitoring system has seismographs um infrasound recorders and all of that sort of thing um you know from basically all over the globe in addition to radiation monitoring equipment so that if someone violates the ban that they can immediately tell uh, by triangulation they can say hey we have detected seismic waves in japan and taiwan you know in china um north korea just detonated a, nu a nuclear device again and that way they can trust but verify as ronald reagan would have said so this is lacking in the environmental modification convention and that's what i hope to change um, not only for the purposes of weather warfare clandestine secret you know programs run by russia china america israel um are the main you know culprits that you know would use this sort of technology um possibly iran um but mainly America, Russia, China, Israel could be doing weather warfare at any point and nobody would know. Um, what's worse is this global, this geoengineering idea, um, Diane Seidel at the Weather Modification Conference at the American Meteorological Society said, we could not detect rogue geoengineering. If a country had decided to, to go ahead and do unilateral geoengineering or just make the decision that they're going to change the entire climate um, on their own we would never be able to tell the difference or assign blame to that individual country or individual in what in some cases um, there was a gentleman named russ george who did the Haida salmon restoration project who dumped iron in the ocean and created a large artificial algae bloom that is a geoengineering technique known as ocean iron fertilization. So he was dubbed the world's first rogue geoengineer. If somebody were to decide to spray chemicals on a worldwide basis to cool the planet, we would never know who did it. This prompted the CIA to contact a geoengineering scientist, Alan Robach, and literally ask him the question, if somebody were messing with the weather over our country, would we know it? And he said, it's probably likely, I guess. Um, but, you know, that would be dependent on the amount of chemicals they use and, uh, you know, our ability to, you know, catch it with atmospheric sensors. But, of course, what Diane Seidel from NOAA says flies in the face of that. The answer is definitively no. Um, but Alan Robach added, I couldn't help but think to myself that the CIA was also indirectly asking me if we were screwing with the weather over some other country, could they tell? And that's where we really, you know, the rubber meets the road with the Environmental Modification Accountability Act. Um, the idea here is to make an addendum and, you know, an add on to uh, the NMOD weather warfare ban to require two things, transparency and verification. Because we did it with the limited test ban treaty, we were able to you know, bring verification uh, to this ban on nuclear explosions because bans are a piece of paper and they don't really stop people from doing things. Um, you, you have to have some kind of enforcement tool behind it some way to catch people in the act or it's pointless you can tell everybody not to rob stores but without cameras and police there's really no way that anybody would ever stop robbing stores the same is true with robbing water resources and changing the climate um, what i hope to do with the environmental modification accountability act is bring transparency and verification to the end mod ban of weather warfare ban of 1978 by requiring a 48 hour minimum notice before any company, any individual, any government does benign, benevolent, you know, good weather modification um, using cloud seeding or any of the other types of technologies available to them. They just have to tell us in advance, tell us their purpose, 
and tell us what types of chemicals they're going to use or what type of apparatus they're going to use. Um, so that if they accidentally cause a tornado or cause a flood, that they can be held liable in a court of law. And that would bring not only transparency, but accountability to the weather modification industry. Um, we have the Weather Modification Reporting Act of 1972 in America that requires anybody in America who intends on modifying the weather to report it to NOAA. And there are two forms you fill out, one before you start, and then one in the middle and at the end, it's the same form. It's called the intermediate report. But regardless, it's like a you know progress report. Did you make it rain? What chemicals did you use? How big of an area? That's how I was able to create the maps that I showed earlier, uh, was from those NOAA reports. We need that on a worldwide scale, but we need it in advance. And in today's information age, it should be available in real time on a website um, in one place. And of course, in a hard copy, but regardless, so that the entire public has a view of this, so that meteorologists have a view of this. I've interviewed many meteorologists who are completely unaware of weather modification activity, even in their own county. And I'm telling them, this is the company doing it. You know, Denver Water paid for it. North American Weather Consultants are doing it. They're doing it right now in your county. And you're completely unaware of this. How do you predict the weather? Um, so this is not just for the public, this is for the scientific community. It will benefit mankind as a whole because you're not going to stop weather modification with the trillions of dollars that are flowing into the coffers of the individuals doing this. Um, people want water and they want it now. Um, but the second point is that by not telling us that you're doing weather modification and we catch you in the act, now you are bordering on weather warfare. Why didn't you tell us? What were you actually up to? So how do you catch um, military or hostile environmental modification um, activities? You create two sensor networks. One would be made similar to the international monitoring system that is run by all of the governments and institutions of the world their, their best satellites, their best, you know, weather monitoring equipment, their best cameras, um, obviously flight tracking, electromagnetic frequency tracking, all of that combined into one super network that could detect when people are um, modifying the weather in addition to something that does not occur today, collecting rainfall samples and analyzing them, you know, with a spectrograph to see what chemicals are raining out. This is something that doesn't even exist. There is no data sets for it. I intend on creating a climate viewer for your backyard for the second sensor network, a citizen powered sensor network. During the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear meltdown, the EPA has something called RADNET, which is one of the radiation monitoring systems. Canada has one as well. Both were shut off or shut down during the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear meltdown because they didn't want the public to be outraged about how many uh, you know, radioactive isotopes of iodine and cesium were raining down on them at the moment. And then after most of the major you know, radioactive rainfall stopped, magically those networks came back on. That's why I proposed two sensor networks, one run by the governments and, you know, of the world, but the other run by citizens. Um, because at the end of the day, we're getting to a point where this technology is small enough, it's getting cheap enough that we could create our own network to monitor for weather modification activities, poisonous chemicals coming down in our rainfall, have a real-time camera mounted on top of the equipment that streams video of your sky to an internet, to a map, um, and that would be ideal. So that's what I hope to do um, with the Environmental Modification Accountability Act, an act to end atmospheric experimentation without notification. If you go to climateviewer.com slash NMOD, that's E-N-M-O-D, you can read all about it, about the International Registry of Atmospheric Experimentation. Yes, I made that up, 
Um, but hey, you've got to make it up to get the idea started, and that's where we're going to kick it off. There is a PowerPoint presentation that you can uh, take a look at, and it will, you know, take you through the general ideas about, you know, the the history of this and why it's necessary. Who's, you know, the major players? All of the ten technologies involved in weather modification uh, today, and uh, you know why why this is necessary that we have transparency and verification. Um, and I'm going to quickly kick, uh, click to the end of, the, uh, of this, trans <laughs> this uh, presentation. You can download this PowerPoint presentation, send it to your representatives. I hope to be pushing this into law in the very near future, visiting DC and doing a little bit of lobbying myself. Um, but you know, the, the, the idea is pr pretty well laid out here, even why we don't just ban weather modification altogether. You know, I've made all the arguments for you. Um, verification, uh, the climate viewer network. And, you know, at the end of the day, this is what it would look like, you know, a real time sensor network map. Hey, we think weather modification is happening here. That's, you know, not good, um, leading to hostile or dangerous conditions, things like that. And the, the idea is real simple, require notice up front with a registry, catch bad guys using sensors, no fear. That's you. And this solution is available at climateviewer.com slash E-N-M-O-D. Um, and that pretty much concludes my presentation. I've already gotten uh, gained support. I went to the 21st conference on planned inadvertent weather modification, and I interviewed several individuals while I was there. Um, and James Roger Fleming being the top, uh, my target, because he's one of my personal heroes, and uh, he said, I think there's a real important role you can play in this. I think there's a role to keep accountability there. Dr. David Keith, who is one of the top geoengineering scientists on the planet, said, I think a public notice makes sense because I think transparency is very important for building trust. I think 48 hours is much too short a period. Um, but he's referring to geoengineering. So obviously it would have to vary but cloud seeding companies work on a very short time span. I mean, cl the clouds form, they're like, hey, we have an opportunity here within the next day or two to make it rain. So they would work on a much shorter period. Geoengineering projects would require a much longer time span. We're talking months, if not years. And in my personal opinion, geoengineering should be banned altogether. Um, that is something that should never happen because it's one of those things that once you start, you don't stop. It's kind of like heroin. Um, and Dr. Ken Caldera said much of the same, you know, that um, he would support this, this sort of legislation. Also a geoengineer, um, Dr. Renault, director, um, a climate scientist as well said, I don't oppose in mod AA. In fact, we need it. Um, so, you know, I've done my due diligence to, you know, go approach these individuals about this topic and say, hey, you know, what do you think about um, the idea of a weather warfare ban um, with teeth? And, you know, they ate it up. And you can see all of those interviews that I did. Dr. Daniel Rosenfeld from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem on geoengineering and climate change. Um, all of these were done at the 21st conference on planet inadvertent weather modification at the AMS's 98th annual meeting in Austin, Texas. Dr. William R. Cotton, who was involved in the um, Project Storm Fury uh, weather uh, steering hurricanes. Um, and I interviewed Raytheon, UCAR, the U.S. Naval Research Lab, um, a fellow activist who's trying to protect the bees. Dr. Jim Fleming, the top historian on the planet on weather modification. Um, and, you know, there's me talking to Raytheon, wearing their cool augmented reality things. And I asked the guy that's the F-18 pilot, can you change the weather in this thing? And he literally just did a pinch and then did this and the weather changed. I said, wow, if it was only that easy in real life. So some of these are quite comical, but man-made versus nature, how would you know? And that's really the question of the day. Um, and I hope to answer that question by, you know, creating a situation where, you know, we have transparency and accountability for this sort of thing. So um, 
if we have any questions, um, I think I'm pretty much done with running through this, Charles. No, that's very, <clears throat> that's very good. I have to say, it's great that you've decided to pick up the mantle on this issue because needless to say, it affects everybody pretty dramatically. And, uh, and it's nice to see what you put together. That collateral is fantastic because, you know, everyone's so busy. They need to be able to deliver stuff on a platter in a minute to somebody else. So you've done a great job. Other than like going to those sites that you cited, and we will list those in the credits on the video for this, what kind of call to action or what is a consumer to do that, that finds out about this other than just getting on like your email list, so to speak? Well, I mean, talk to your, your local representative about this issue. Um, if you're into the, you know, if, if, if you're aggravated by seeing, you know, climate change people out in the streets, you know, banning straws, um, approach them with this information, you know, bring a tablet with you, just bring weather modification history.com up and ask them, how much do you know about this topic? Have conversations with people. I ask people all the time, I'll go into a gas station and I'll say, what's that? And they'll say, that's a cloud. And I said, really? Have you ever seen anything straight, a straight cloud in your entire life? And then they double take and they go, wait a minute, what is that? I said, well, that's actually created by a plane. It has pretty significant effects on the environment. Um, by the way, did you know that the military said that they, they would like to be able to create clouds to block out spa spy satellites in space? Um, they also want to be able to create clouds at night during you know, battles so that they can block out moonlight and make our you know, night vision goggles more effective. I have Freedom of Information Act requests saying just that. So is that just a cloud or is that something you might want to be a little more interested in? They're always like, wow, that, you know, I'd never even noticed. That's because everybody is doing this, you know, with their cell phone in their hand and they're not doing this very often anymore. So right now, the best thing that the, the individual do, can do is raise awareness of what's going on, get educated about it. Have discussions with, you know, your family about it, for starters, practice there. Um, of course, you know, if you have a family like mine, my, you know, my, my family has like a no controversy, um, no controversial topics at the dinner table policy. This is my dad and my mom. Um, so whenever we go over there to eat, it's kind of hard to really talk about anything, but um you know, unless it's completely benign, but regardless, you, you really want to go out and get educated on the topic and then hound your representative to look into these topics, to understand, you know, the legislation that I'm, you know, proposing here is something that needs to happen. Um, it is on the sidebar of every single page of climateviewer.com. So if you go to any article, any index, there's a link right there. Um, and again, that's climateviewer.com slash nmod. Um, I'm right now looking to have somebody write this up in a very legal format. Um, the solution is very simple. Um, it was written into the Environmental Modification Act itself. Any amendment to this act should just be proposed by the state, um, you know, any one of the member states um, so simply, I take this piece of paper to the State Department. The State Department takes the piece of paper to the UN Security Council. They have one vote. If they vote yes, it is international law immediately. Um, in addition to that, we hope to come up with a state by state model of the same type of legislation um, where, you know, one state could literally be just modifying. You know, checking for modifications to its weather from adjoining states um, so that they can hold them liable because the, the runoff from the Rocky Mountains doesn't just affect around the Rocky Mountains. I mean, we're, some of this goes as far as the Mississippi River. So if you're having major flooding all along the Mississippi River and people are completely unaware that their company's raking in millions and millions of dollars, to put artificial snow on top of the Rocky Mountains, which put more snow there than should be. And then there's flooding as a result of that, somebody should probably be held liable for that. So these are the types of topics that need to be discussed in a public forum. 
people need to be educated about it, and then we can do something about these catastrophes that are likely caused by, you know, weather, weather modification companies, and of course, finally get to the bottom of, you know, who's really controlling the weather before we ever get to a place where they say, CO2 and global warming are so bad, we're gonna do geoengineering on a global scale, and literally a group of individuals who are non-elected will have a thermometer that they have control over and which will also affect rainfall patterns worldwide. So I hope to bring awareness to all of this by you know, the 10 years of research that I've done. I've put it into these packages to make it as digestible as possible for the you know, lowest common denominator. And I hope that people will use it. That's my goal is to you know, educate people, try to you know, get this law passed, and hopefully my daughters will grow up in a world where they can still see the stars because according to all predictions, due to aircraft traffic, um, creating cirrus clouds and or geoengineering by 2050, the stars will be un, you know, invisible, invisible and uh, terrestrial astronomy will be a thing of the past. That is not a kind of future that I want for our planet, our people, um, vitamin D absorption, all of that being, you know, health effects issues of that um, aside. Um, this enough is enough. History is, you know, those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it. And history is truly repeating itself now. We went from the 1800s to 1978 without any real accountability for all of the people who were modifying the weather. And then there was crickets. And now you can imagine the technology they had in 1978 versus today. And there has really been no discussion of using lasers to steer lightning bolts, using lasers to make it rain, um, ionosphere heaters, modifying the entire globe's magnetosphere. Um, we need a new um, environmental modification, you know, accountability act to catch up to the technology today to really you know bring them all under um some kind of you know legal framework that's going to hold them accountable if they do damage that hurts people um and i think that i've come up i've thought long and hard about this and uh you know this this idea came to me in full fruition just a couple of years ago, and I've been doing this for 10 years, scratching my head going, what can I do about this? And this is a, uh, you know, grounded in history. It's a law that's already on the books. It just simply needs um, some teeth. So that's what I hope to do. No, that's very good. It's a logical extension. So what's smart is you're building off of an existing platform than trying to seem like a radical change. And it's commonsensical exactly. and it's commonsensical. Uh, we're running out of time here, so we're going to kind of zip some questions in. David, are you there? I got you unmuted. Yes, uh, thanks, Jeff. Uh, Jim, this is David Pratt Demers with the Roads to Freedom Foundation. Do nice the major computer weather models take weather modification into account? And if so, can they accurately detect weather modification activities? Can you speak briefly on that? The answer is no and no. Um, at the weather modification conference before the one I went to, these typically happen every two years at the, weather, at the American Meteorological Society's annual meetings. Um, the last one was in 2018. I went to that one. Um, the next one's going to be January 13th through 15th in 2020. I intend on being at that one. Um, and I'm going to hopefully be setting up a, a a table to talk specifically about the NMOD AA, as I like to call it, the environment, the NMOD Accountability Act. But at the previous one in 2016 or 2015, actually, um, of some friends of mine who were there, they interviewed the head of the National Weather Service and the head of the Storm Prediction Center who were standing side by side coincidentally. And he asked them that exact question you just asked. Do you guys take into account weather modification activities when predicting the weather? Their response is, well, is flabbergasting. Uh, well, they don't tell us when they modify the weather, which is a blatant lie because 
who owns both the National Weather Service and the Storm Prediction Center? NOAA. Who does the Weather Modification Reporting Act of 1972 require you to report weather modification activities to? NOAA. So for the directors of both of those divisions to say that A, they don't account for weather modification at all in any of their forecasts, and B, they don't even know, um, should be a major red flag for everybody because A, they should know, and B, if weather modification activities do work, you would certainly want to account for them when predicting the weather. So either these companies are stealing millions of dollars from you know, water resource boards across the country um, and they're not making it rain or they're making it rain and the, the people who are predicting the weather, they're always wrong because they can't predict the weather because they don't have all the variables necessary to make the predictions they're trying to make. Does that make sense? It certainly does. Kids are impressionable. That's why here at this station, we watch the programs and commercials your child watches carefully. He may see bad guys, but not in the role of heroes. And he'll learn that crime doesn't pay. Because your child's welfare is our concern, too. That's part of our code. Better than anything you can get without a prescription. Anything. It's the best.